Two years ago, I sat down and started thinking which sort of game should I make? Should it be a racing game, a puzzle, a shooter? The game that I made is about a knight that runs around and kills monsters, trying to protect innocent villagers and get them to safety quickly. The game is on Android, so Google Play, and I'm currently working to put it on App Store. You can download it for free on both of these platforms, though if you like the idea and would like to support me, you can do so directly inside of the game. Just swipe left and click on one of the support buttons. The game itself is pretty simple, but it took pretty damn long time to make. And it's all about the challenges and all about unforeseen circumstances that uh, I've encountered along the way. I've spent about two months uh, laying down and trying to combine different scripts to make um, it like a monorail game where the character moves on a rail and then the camera is like dolly camera it pans around also on its own rail and looks down at the character now that there is a selfie stick following the character how do I make it rotate continuously and nicely and smoothly as we are moving the character through the level there is no clear way of how much the player ran through the level because it's all about traveling through the volume through all possible positions of the character across the level. So the brilliant idea and pretty bold idea was to scrap all of that monorail garbage and it would, be, it would mean wasting two months of my work, which uh, unfortunately I did, and switch it for network of uh, nodes, a Delaunay mesh. This web is stretched across the level, and as you're traveling through the level, as the camera flies through the level's volume, you are looking at which points are you closest to, or which group of four points you are closest to, and interpolate between the rotations encoded in those points to estimate at how the camera should look like at this specific position in this volume. I guess what I really want to say is that even though I had a chance of scrapping away two months or one and a half months of my work, you really shouldn't do it. You should foresee that. Try to iterate really quickly. Try to see if uh, things will not match before you spend a lot of time doing that. Which brings me to the second point, in that you shouldn't really focus on developing the framework, and there could be different frameworks for interactions between abilities, spawning of creatures, their behavior. Try to stay away from really developing beautiful frameworks and try to focus on the game itself. The frameworks are cool in that they make your um, game cleaner to debug and faster to perform even sometimes and uh, less prone to errors. For example, I have a framework for my abilities. Different creatures uh, can cast various spells that can enhance each other. And I didn't want to hard code enhancements between those abilities because I realize as I'm going to be adding more and more and more abilities, Soon there's going to be just a spaghetti of code where different abilities are referencing other abilities, checking for enhancements on other abilities, and so on. So instead of that, I made a framework of spells, which I'm very proud of. It really allows me to add extra abilities as I'm expanding the game. I'm pretty certain of that. It even keeps track of the history of damage that was done by ability, and we can even recall it and revert it and re-enhance it and dampen different damage. It's really nice. As I was developing my game, I had three choices of working. Either to um, make 3D models, or to program my frameworks, or to program the gameplay itself. Or to even animate something, like characters and things. One thing that I observed is that 3D and modeling is a huge blessing, has a huge blessing, because it's sort of isolated from the entire game. As long as it fits um, style-wise into your game, you're good to go. You don't have to worry about bugs that might appear, and you don't have to really worry about integrating it into your project. It's a lot simpler. Except there is one thing that you should really watch out for. As you're designing your level, as you're putting the decorations within your level, think about the story which you're telling through those decorations. Don't stick generic rocks and forest uh, as you're developing the game. Just think about what your environment is about, what might have occurred in there. Maybe thieves have attacked a caravan and now everything is scattered within this level and you can see gems scattered across the level. Gems are sticking out from certain places where somebody was hiding them. Maybe there is like a little gnome or gnome that's living there. Let your fantasy keep going and try to tell the story. You don't even have to put the characters that were there. 
you can put a setting and have a feeling, create a feeling. But you should really, as you're putting each decoration, think about its place in the story uh, that's being told through the game. Your game might be even about something different, but the environment should be pretty alive. And how do you make it alive? You ensure that the decorations are fitting theme-wise and the context is being created. So the player, as he's playing the game, can relate to something, can think about the decorations and he realizes that they are not just placed there just to occupy some space. They all have some sort of meaning and they tie together. I would uh, grab a list of concept art that I found on Google that really resembled and conveyed the feeling that I wanted to portray for my game. I would circle out different interesting parts um, on the images, something that I could incorporate in the game, different observations. For example, as I mentioned about mushrooms and rocks and fences, or how the web is in different corners of the catacombs, where it's positioned, where the light is coming out from. Maybe there are some uh, broken wooden planks. Maybe there are spears sticking from somewhere. All of those ideas I would just take out from there and then put somewhere else in my game. I didn't copy it at all. I would just um, grab the imagination of a person from several parts and would maybe use it somewhere else. Maybe I would use the spears somewhere in the swamp. Um, maybe there is a tribe of people living there. There is another point which I want to talk about, also related to design, in that you have to really watch out for lighting within your game. I wished to transition from night to, for example, a sunset on, or sunrise and then a day. How would I do it on a mobile device and how would I ensure that the quality of light stays cool? I could go for a dynamic light which constantly shines and can be changed easily within the game, but then the quality would deteriorate significantly because I would immediately lose the ability to do global illumination. I didn't want to do real-time global illumination and from what I can see right now it would be a killer because it would consume way too much energy and way too much performance and my game wouldn't run at 50 frames per second on uh, Samsung Galaxy S5. Instead I went for baked global illumination, non-directional. That means that my light maps, the way of capturing lighting in a texture, could be just placed into RGB three channels and then would be compressed down using crunch compression um, down to the lowest possible setting and it still looked great. Yes, there were some noise specs on the texture due to compression, but the entire light map for my entire level would consume about one and a half megabyte, can you imagine? And uh, light maps would stay really crispy or kind of crispy, um, even at such a high compression. The way I'm, I ensured that they are staying crispy would be to tailor each object, each object's scale within the light map, personally, manually. I made a brilliant script which allows me to select an object and adjust its scale, its size within the light map, its resolution, how much will it take of light texture. It allowed me to enter a special checkerboard mode and compare different resolutions of uh, various objects to see if they match each other. There were enormous amount of objects that by default would occupy huge uh, texture space and thus would have very sharp looking light maps but would take and explode the size of light maps to an enormous amount 10 and 20 megabytes. By ensuring that each one of them has the same resolution as all other remaining surrounding objects, as the terrain, as its uh, neighbor 3D objects nearby of it, I ensured that the light map is uniform across the entire level. And then I could increment the resolution globally for the entire level. And I would know that all of my objects are sufficiently crispy in terms of light map. This kept me content because I was certain that different objects within my level uh, had received enough attention from me and would look equally good as their neighbors when light mapped. Uh, once again, I want to stress out about the crunch compression. It's really awesome. Use it on the devices. Plus, mobile devices are already so powerful that even several years old devices, mobile devices, they will still support it. But make sure to test it though. But crunch compression is amazing. By default, it should be your main compression, from what I found out. Even on the lowest possible setting, it still looks great. Make sure to use it by default. Yes, it does throw out some colors, but does it really matter? If you're an outside visitor, would you really see that there is some colors missing? Only if there is something really important should you consider increasing the quality of crunch compression. 
because oftentimes it's a trade-off between one megabyte of size and 200 kilobytes. So watch out for compression and uh, just go for the highest possible compression with the lowest possible settings. It's going to be awesome and it's going to make your game really tidy on the phone. As you've built the game in Unity, your editor log is going to list all of the assets that your game has included because somebody uh, references them from your script or from somewhere else, maybe from prefabs. Those are the assets that made into your package. You should really look at them and their sizes. And if you see something utterly huge, like super big, you should come back and fix it within your project. You should come back and reduce the quality or uh, use different compression, verify that it's actually um, enabled because there are different modes for iOS, for computer, for Android. And uh, even though iOS might have a crunch compression, as you flip to Android, you might see that it's actually using some other form of compression, which is um, a lot larger in terms of size. Compress your textures, compress your meshes, and compress your sounds. Sounds use OGG for a mobile device, just use mono, because mono is gonna half the size of your um, files. And you only have one speaker here anyway, and by default, you should use mono for all 3D sounds. That means that if you have a wolf, for example, or a monster that's moving freely around the level and can be at different um, directions uh, related to your character and at different distances away from your character, he's going to be going back and forth and you're not going to be able to tell if his sounds are stereo or mono. So always use for 3D sounds, most cases, 99% of time you want to use mono. Uh, the only time you want to use stereo is for music, for example, or for two-dimensional sounds that are played always at the same volume into your ears, regardless of where you are. I've noticed that terrains occupy a large, a huge amount of texture space on light maps, possibly the biggest. And uh, if we want to ensure that the lighting on them is going to stay crisp, as crisp as the lighting on the decorations, on the walls, on the fences, and so on, on the bushes, then we're going to be increasing the resolution for the entire terrain piece. And most of the time, sometimes, or you know, oftentimes, you're not going to be able to see big portions of the terrain. You're guaranteed not to ever see them. They're never going to be seen and they're wasting the light map. They're still occupying the space and it still has to be transferred to the device. But that light map is never going to be seen. So is there something we can do? Yes, there is. We can use multiple terrains. But one thing you should watch out for is that as you're using multiple terrains, I'm pretty certain that they're drawn in separate passes. So you're drawing the first huge piece, maybe some decorations, then you're drawing another huge piece of the terrain, and so on. So they're not drawn at once. I think they are not batched, but don't quote me on this. Uh, I know that the more terrains you have, the less performant it will be. Terrain system itself has a built-in culling system where if you are looking at different portions of the terrain, it's subdivided such that some of them are thrown away and are not rendered by the camera. But the point here is that even those pieces that are not rendered by the camera and are not wasting performance, they're still occupying texture space on the light maps and thus are wasting your uh, precious size of your app because your app shouldn't be too big. It shouldn't be like 20 gigs. It should be 500 megabytes, probably, if it's a very big game, or 200 megabytes. The smaller, the better, and light maps contribute to that a lot. You would rather um, use that precious space of light map texture, not so on some portion of the terrain, but on some other piece, some other decoration, and thus maybe even increase the mm, crispiness of all of the details on, all, on the entire level at once rather than wasting it on some invisible uh, portion of the terrain. Coming down to the next point, you should be constantly building for your target device, especially if it's a mobile phone. I was careless enough not to build for two months, and when I finally decided to build, I realized that there are so many errors that are creeping out that it took me two days or three days to fix them, just because it was running on a different device than editor. Doing this constantly and often will allow you to capture efficiently and quickly any deteriorations of frame rate and quality within your phone uh, before you dedicate enough of effort to develop something that runs poorly on your device. I had to drop out the support for GLES2, which uh, means that this device can't run it, Samsung Galaxy S4, because I noticed that some of those devices cannot render cutout shaders. Can you imagine? It means that this device wouldn't be able to run it because it doesn't support a discard operation within the shaders. 
So you wouldn't be able to throw away fragments or pixels for your objects if they are below a certain alpha threshold. It just wouldn't render at all on the device. As I would launch the game, my terrains would render, the shadows would render, but the objects uh, which would be using those cutout shaders, my bushes, my trees, they wouldn't be there. And so, because I noticed this very late into the development, I had to literally exclude this device, because I was not building often enough, and I noticed this only after I've surrounded my entire level with cutout shaders. So, only devices that are able to run OpenGL ES 3.0 are able to support my game, which is kind of sad, but that's what you get. And this way, I actually guarantee myself that the frame rate is going to be fairly sufficient. It's very important to talk about the people that you work with, how do you choose maybe your team, or how do you select your freelancers, and how do you ensure that they won't mess things up. In my personal opinion, you should pay a special attention to two people, uh, how you choose them. The first one is the programmer, and as you are selecting this person, you should be adamant, you should be 100% sure that he will stay all the way through your project, through ups and downs, and that he's not going to abandon you halfway through. Because if he does, and he has written a lot of code and beautiful frameworks, then it's going to be fairly challenging for you to find somebody else who is going to know it by heart, know his own code, know, I mean, know the code of that person who left you uh, by heart and understand it. Because people write in different things and they all put hacks in there, uh, so on and so forth. So your programmer should stay through the end, till the end with you, even if your team feels unmotivated in some parts of the development, if it feels monotonous, you should be certain that this person will stay with you. It should be the person that you trust. And the second person is the animator. Usually you can substitute different decorations by finding them on Asset Store uh, or by freelancing them out to somebody else. But the, your animator really has the idea of your game. Maybe it's a freelancer animator, but he still has the capability to make those animations which you can't find on the internet, which are unique to your game and which are constantly up in the face of the player, because he's constantly seeing characters, unless your game is about cars or maybe starships or something of that sort. But if you have characters, animator is uh, really the person to look for. You want to get a good animator and you want to make sure that uh, he focuses on things that are most important to your main character, secondary characters, and only then maybe some props, uh, birds, and whatever. Make him create the most important things within your game first, and then focus on additional stuff. Don't rely on code assets. Don't try to buy frameworks from um, Asset Store, because oftentimes they are generic written so that they support majority of games. They have a lot of unnecessary code, they're oftentimes bloated, and from what I've seen, people don't really care about the performance on them, unless it's some really good uh, assets, such as uh, specific assets for pathfinding, but I'm not advertising anything. You will find it on Asset Store. There are certain um, really good assets on uh, Asset Store. Two months from now on, you're not going to be able to recall a thing about your code. You're only going to have something vague, vague about it. Just the idea of how it functions, but you won't be able to see if it's fairly complex how this structure actually behaves straight away. You will have to dedicate one or two days to recall your framework, recall how it's working. It's going to take time, so make sure to code for yourself in the future. Foresee things that you're going to be wondering about in the future, and if you foresee them, just drop a little comment saying that this is what I intended to do. Don't try to fix it, don't try to change it, because that's how it's supposed to be working. If you're putting out too many comments, like I did, there is a possibility that as you're changing code and changing the function names, scrapping some of them, there is going to be some dangling uh, comments that are remaining somewhere else, which you've forgotten about, and now they lie, suggesting of what should be done, because those functions no longer exist, and so on. But if there are fewer comments, you have so much more flexibility, and you don't have to carry out this huge pile of comments that you should also worry about and adjust. If you've uh, found a solution to a problem that you know was very challenging and you've spent a lot of time doing it and nobody helped you and you couldn't find help anywhere, yet you found the solution and you managed to solve it, go to forum, make a post where you ask this question and then immediately post your answer that you found. Doing this is a 
something on another level that some people might not even consider doing because they're too greedy or think that nobody else deserves it. There were countless times when I couldn't find a solution on the internet and uh, it just so happened that one person posted this exact thing. Before you start your project or your uh, team begins to work on a project, if you're, especially if you're an indie developer team, which I think you are, just make sure that there is nothing that will kill you outright. And usually those things happen and lurk in uh, areas that you're sort of certain about, but not too much. Put out all of the things on paper or on a notepad that will uh, require your attention as you're developing the game. Highlight areas that you are not so certain about and reevaluate them many times before you begin working. I've seen a couple of teams who have broken up and I feel personally that's because they didn't uh, really anticipate those difficulties that they are going to face. And sometimes difficulties are going to be very challenging in terms of motivation where you just have to plow through it because it's just monotonous and repetitive. The larger your team is, the more chance that somebody will drop out from it. Try to evaluate each person and see if he drops out or if she drops out, how are we going to be able to take it further on without this person? Are we going to be able to substitute him or her? Um, is his leaving going to be detrimental to the project? Um, and so on. Like so, I'd like to conclude this session. I hope it helped you. Once again, please go ahead and uh, download my game. It's free to play. It's on Google Play and soon will be on App Store. The game itself is a bit simple right now, but the cool thing about it is its gist is in place, its idea is in place, and the framework is done. Adding new things is going to be very simple right now and very easy. But I need your comments and your ideas and your thoughts about the game. Maybe you can uh, come up with something I should add, or maybe there is something you really wish to see in the game. Adding new monsters, new sounds, decorations, new levels is easy, because I already know what to do to achieve it and I finally found out this core and this diamond. Um, yes, so thank you once again, and I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.